In this video, we'll talk about the process of gastrulation and focusing on the human gastrulation angle. Gastrulation is a set of coordinated movement which is very important for an embryonic development. According to the famous embryologist Louis Wolpert, it's not birth, marriage or death, but gastrulation which is truly the most important time of your life. So what really happens during gastrulation? During the gastrulation process, the cells of blastula are given new positions. They migrate into a new neighborhood in a very coordinated fashion. And that's the key time to establish body axis and different germ layers. So here is epiblast and the cells of the epiblast would be reorganized in a coordinated fashion to give rise to layers like endoderm, ectoderm and mesoderm. In short, that is the process of gastrulation. Now this movement is not haphazard. This movement is highly coordinated and each movement has features. And there are different kinds of movement that can possibly occur during gastrulation. Like invagination, involution, ingression, delamination or even epiboli. Now all these movements are not happening all at once. There could be a combination of movement that can occur in one organism. And this kind of morphogenetic movements are different throughout the different animal kingdom. I have a different video on morphogenetic movement. So in this video, if we cut a long story to short, we would understand that gastrulation is all about coordinated movements of a pool of cells. And this movement involves the entire embryo. And patterns of gastrulation could vary throughout the animal kingdom. There could be different types of movements happening during gastrulation. Now, all the patterns of movement doesn't happen at once. A combination of these morphogenetic movements that we discussed happens during gastrulation. And we'll take an example of the human embryo to understand this better. So this is about the end of second week of uh, human gestation. At this point of time, the blastocyst is implanted into the uterine wall. So at around day 15, you can see a distinct chorionic cavity. Here is the primitive stalk and you can see the embryo is hanging through the primitive stalk. So now let's look at the embryo in 3D. So here in red, you can see the epiblast, which would eventually give rise to the embryo. And here is the hypoblast, which would give rise to the yolk sac. So basically it's amniotic cavity which is in between the epiblast cells and it is yolk sac between the hypoblast cells. During the process of gastrulation, the bilaminar embryonic disc which is composed of epiblast and hypoblast ultimately gives rise to ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. And this process happens in a coordinated fashion over a period of time. So let's look at the embryo in 3D. So we can look at the embryo hanging in the chorionic cavity. And here is the amniotic cavity in the embryo. And here is the yolk sac. So at this point of time, at the caudal end of the embryo, a primitive streak forms. And this is a thickening which contains a midline groove. And it forms the mid-sagittal plane of the embryonic disc. Over the course of next day, this thickening, which is known as the primitive streak, elongates and occupy almost half the uh, span of the embryonic disc. And thereby, the primitive groove is formed. So at the cranial end of this primitive streak, there is a formation known as the primitive node. So this primitive node is really important to understand the process of gastrulation. And a depression at around the primitive node is formed, which is known as the primitive pit. It contains a depression. Now the cells move through the primitive streak inside uh, the embryo. And this, is, this process is known as ingression. So let's leave the jargon and try to understand what is ingression?
But during gastrulation, epiblast cells move towards the primitive streak, enter through the primitive streak, and then migrate away from the primitive streak as an individual cell. So overall, a lot of cellular aspects are associated with this process. Let's try to understand this better. So follow the arrow to look at the cell movement. First of all, these cells are moving towards the primitive streak, through the primitive streak, and moving away uh, the primitive streak inside, from the inside of the embryo. So this is the ingression process. Now if we look at the cross-section of the embryo, we can appreciate this movement. Look at the arrow and see how the cells move first uh, inward, then downward, and then again inward. And this movement is ingression and it is key to understand the formation of the germ layers. Now here we are looking at the epiblast and hypoblast from our top view. And this, if we cut a cross section along this angle, we would have a view like this. One thing is, to, one thing is important to note that there is a pro or precordal plate which is defining the cranial end of the embryo. The precordal plate contributes to the oropharyngeal membrane, a two-layered membrane that would eventually be ruptured to give rise to the mouth opening. Also, this precordal or procordal plate works like an important signaling center which is crucial for the neural tube formation. Now, if we orient ourselves towards the embryo, this is the caudal end, there is a cranial and left-right end. Now there are certain signaling happening which is allowing the formation of the primitive streak. So the primitive streak induction happens uh, via activity of wind, TGF beta, etc. And in the cranial end there are uh, molecules which counteracts this wind activity and thereby a gradient is generated and along this gradient a cranial to caudal axis is formed. So this is the induction of the primitive streak and this is the formation of the primitive streak which triggers the process of ingression. Now formation of the definitive endoderm is the next process. At around day 16, many of the epiblast cells move inside by the process of ingression which is one type of uh, morphogenetic movement and they populate the inside of the embryo. Eventually, they replace the cells in the hypoblast layer and eventually form the definitive endoderm. So, first, the cells need to detach from the epiblast layer. And this happens via a process known as epithelial to mesenchymal transition. If you want to learn more about EMT, click on the I button. So, the first ingress ingressing epiblast cells invade the hypoblast and displace its cells to create the definitive endoderm. Some of the epithelial cells migrating, migrating through the primitive streak diverge into the space between the epiblast and the definitive endoderm. And this is kind of like the intra-embryonic mesoderm. So this layer in violet would be eventually becoming the mesoderm of the embryo. So these violet cells are actually going to give rise to the mesoderm. And at the last, the ectoderm forms. So once the formation of the definitive endoderm and intraembryonic mesoderm is complete, epiblast cells no longer need to move towards and ingress through the primitive streak. So they eventually give rise to the ectoderm layer and thereby three germ layer formation is kind of complete. So what we learned so far? Gastrulation is nothing but choreographed series of movements which helps to form three important germ layers known as ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. And each of these germ layers are important for organogenesis. For example, if we look at the ectoderm, it gives rise to central nervous system, brain, skin, adrenal medulla to name a few. And then mesoderm give rise to kidney, reproductive system, bone, heart, and spleen. Whereas endoderm give rise to GI tract, liver, endocrine system, urethra, bladder, etc.
So obviously, gastrulation is the first milestone that has to be achieved during the process of development. Eventually, there would be many modifications and influences from inside and outside environment. The very next thing that happens is the neural tube formation. Neural tube formation is a complicated process. And in the next video, we would talk about the neural tube. So if you look at the embryo from a top view right now and a cross section view, you can completely imagine that this flat sheet of ectodermal cells are eventually folding to form a tube like organization. And this is the neural tube. Eventually, our brain is nothing about but a tube. At one side, it is blown up like a balloon in the brain side and other side it's tapering in the spinal cord. So in the next video we'll talk about the neural tube folding process and the defects associated with neural tube folding. So stay tuned for more. You can get more flashcards and notes in my Facebook page or Instagram page. You can support our channel using super thanks or you can pay via PayPal or UPI. See you in next video.